PowerPoint kills. Does PowerPoint really kill? Some might argue that very point. Edward Tufte is a professor emeritus at Yale, where he taught courses in statistical evidence, information design, and interface design. The New York Times has dubbed him the Leonardo da Vinci of data. In his book, The Cognitive Style of PowerPoint, he states, Imagine a widely used and expensive prescription drug that claimed to make us beautiful but didn't. Instead, the drug had frequent, serious side effects, making us stupid, degrading the quality and credibility of our communication, turning us into bores, wasting our colleagues' time. The side effects, and the resulting unsatisfactory cost-benefit ratio, would rightly lead to a worldwide product recall. Tufty believes that the misuse of PowerPoint contributed to the tragedy of the Space Shuttle Columbia. While NASA engineers were investigating the physical remnants of Columbia, Tufty was analyzing the actual design of the PowerPoint slides used to communicate within NASA as well as from contractors to the space agency. The Columbia Accident Investigation Board also pointed out that it frequently received PowerPoint briefings instead of technical papers. According to Tufty, in the reports, Every single text slide uses bullet outlines with four to six levels of hierarchy. Then another multi-level list, another bureaucracy of bullets, starts afresh for a new slide. How is it that each elaborate architecture of thought always fits exactly on one slide? On a more light-hearted note, comedian Don McMillan shows us how often we and others abuse audiences with an array of poor design techniques. As humorous as that is, Tufty limits how PowerPoint is being utilized in education. Particularly disturbing is the adoption of the PowerPoint cognitive style in our schools. Rather than learning to write a report using sentences, children are being taught how to formulate client pitches and infomercials. There's a growing body of research that helps educators better understand how to design presentations which increase attention and retention. In particular, Cognitive scientists have discovered three important features of the human information processing system that are particularly relevant for PowerPoint users, dual channels, that is, people have separate information processing channels for visual material and verbal material. Limited capacity, that is, people can pay attention to only a few pieces of information in each channel at a time. And active processing, that is, people understand the presented material when they pay attention to the relevant material organize it into a coherent mental structure, and integrate it with their prior knowledge. To take full advantage of this research, Richard E. Mayer, a cognitive psychologist at UC Santa Barbara, wrote a book, Multimedia Learning, which provides a set of practical principles to aid the construction of multimedia education materials, including PowerPoint. I have only featured a few of these principles, in an effort to avoid overloading the viewer's channels. For example, the multimedia principle means that people learn better from words and pictures than from words alone. Next, the contiguity principle states that people learn better when corresponding words and pictures are presented at the same time or next to each other on the screen. Another important idea is the coherence principle in which people learn better when extraneous material is excluded rather than included. Look at this actual PowerPoint slide from the U.S. Central Command. It purports to explain the civil war in Iraq, but how effective can it be, based on its clutter design? It easily overwhelms a person's cognitive load, which can have dire consequences. Compare that design quagmire to the simple yet effective layout of a newspaper sports page. Even if you, like me, are not a sports fan, at a glance it's clear what has happened, and who are the main actors in this story. The design invites you to look closer. Tufty supports this by posing the following to the designers of the Iraq War slides, why are our presentations operating at 2% of the data richness of routine tables found in the sports section? Thus, according to Mayer, we should keep in mind the following, in designing a PowerPoint slide it is important to not present an overwhelming amount of information that is, coherence principle, and it is useful to have simple graphics to supplement words that is, multimedia principle. Mayer's final bit of advice is to employ what he calls the personalization principle, in which people learn better from a conversational style than a formal style. In my mind, Steve Jobs exemplifies this whenever he gives his keynote addresses at Macworld. 
where else can you see exemplars of good PowerPoint design? Luckily, these are all over the web, usually freely downloadable. Personally, I really prefer Stanford Law Professor Lawrence Lessig's technique. The Lessig method shuns bullet points in favor of limited text and striking images. He might employ over 100 slides in a single presentation. But he clearly rehearses his talks. He never uses the presentation screen as a teleprompter. Another rich resource is TED. TED Talks are limited to 20 minutes and feature the latest in technology, entertainment, and design. Over 200 of the best of the yearly TED conferences are archived and available at TED.com. There are also many design guides online that you can use with your colleagues and students. My personal favorite is Rowan Manahan's Dodging Bullets in Presentations. My students seem to have the most positive reaction to this guide. David Jakes delves more into the importance of color, image and font choice. His one-hour PowerPoint presentation is also available for free on the website, slideshare.net. In terms of image sources, Jakes and others recommend a wealth of Creative Commons licensed image sites like Flickrstorm, which is not only fun and engaging to use, but also creates for you a unique website that functions as a bibliography. It lists not only the photographer, but also the license and a link to the original photo's website. But once the presentation is over, what should you do afterwards? Consider this research-backed advice from Richard Mayer. Studies showed beneficial effects of giving learners control over the pacing of their multimedia instructions in terms of learning results. For my own students, I have uploaded every single PowerPoint I presented to a website called VoiceThread. It allows my students to review and annotate my presentations outside of class, and at the speed they prefer. This has been a powerful way to study for semester exams and AP tests. In conclusion, please consider Tufti's summary of this powerful tool. PowerPoint is a competent slide manager and projector. But rather than supplementing a presentation, it has become a substitute for it. Such misuse ignores the most important rule of speaking, respect your audience. Don't forget. Credit. All. Of. Your. Sources. My name is Spiro Bolas and you can contact me at spirobolas.blogspot.com. <laughs>